stuff for the liberation of animals, right? So we all, that's what we do. This is the New York, New Jersey community. And I'm going to introduce you to somebody, but I wanted to introduce him to us, right? This is our community, man. This is New York, New Jersey. These are mostly New Jersey folks here, but a lot of people from New York. These are great people that have dedicated their life to animal liberation. Did we not? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank all of you for being here. You're, well, please welcome in your home here. This is a great opportunity that we have here. Um, and I want to give great thanks to, first of all, we'll just give great thanks to the space um, for Druva and Plant Base. Have anyone been here before? Thank you, Druva. How many people have been here before? Oh, one. That's actually two. That's great. So that's good. Because this is a beautiful space, as you can see. The restaurant's next door. They do great community work. Really important. And it's called plant-based, but I really call it vegan-based because there's nothing plant-based about this place. This is a place for activism. This is a place for us to get together. They're doing a lot of stuff in the community. And there's great, incredible food. Look at that. Active, on the activist watch here. There you go. Another great act. Beautiful. Um, I want to, so I want to thank Druva. Wait till you have the food Edgar's going to make. He's unbelievable. Um, also, this is the home of another vegan fridge. You all know that. So this was donated and curated by uh, Vegan Activist Alliance and Chili's on Wheels. Well, is one of the really. Let's give her a hand. Really yeah. Thank you, Peter. Peter, have some great people doing great stuff. Um, so thank you for that. And, and anybody who got any donations for the fridge, please, you can give it to me. I can put it in the fridge. Yeah, and if you don't know this, you can donate food to this fridge here. And this is for this community food desert, and we're offering vegan food so people in the community know, right? So it's great. Wow, right? It's good. We have, there's another one in the city. There's more to come. Um, Druva, thank you. This is our lovely host of the evening, right? A lot of great opportunities for um, community activism and all the other things that are happening, yoga and all kinds of things. I want to thank Nitu Abhinash. I want to thank the uh, World Vegan Vision. If you don't know who they are, please go visit worldveganvision.org. Fantastic 30 years old organization that originally started as a vegetarian organization, right? It's now completely vegan. It has been for how long now? 30 years. 30 years? Five years. Five years, yeah, because I thought it was, yeah. Vegan. Yeah, yeah. And doing incredible work, bringing something like this to you, all the stuff we do for Diwali and all other events. So, so please keep an eye on what they're doing and thank you for that. Um, you know, I'm... My life is committed to activism and to liberation of all animals, and so I am really inspired by so many of you here that we do work together. I'm really inspired by this gentleman, the co-founder of DXE, Direct Action Everywhere. I'm sure you all know it. Um, co-founder of the uh, Simple Heart Initiative, fantastic, and Berkeley, California mayor, all candidates. <laughs> I forgot, I forgot about the fact that I was the losing mayor of Canada. <laughs> You're warming up. You're warming up. It's the next yeah. one. Yeah. And a champ in our movement because I believe it was October, there was a fantastic ruling. Do we all know about this? Yeah. So this man, you know, one of the great things, one of the really great things that he's done is open rescue and normalize that and brought that out into the world so that we can feel empowered to do so. And not just for us, but it's really for the animals, of course. Um, he got caught liberating two animals, and if you 
look at it online, there's a lot of other words talking about what he did, but he, he took two beautiful animals and he brought them to safety. And I can't buy ourselves for the record, because we posted it online. Yeah, so that's what Open Rescue, you don't know what Open Rescue, it's like, hey, we're coming in and taking these animals and rescuing these animals and showing it, there's no hiding it, right? We should never hide that, we should not hide that. But it's hard because we can get in trouble. Well, fortunately this man's a lawyer, so he knows how much trouble he can get into. He represented himself in the case in Utah recently and was acquitted on all charges. All charges. So thank you. And that sets a precedent precedent, which we'll talk about later. That sets a precedent for what we are able to do in this country. That case will be used. If we ever get in trouble, that'll be something that we could use so we don't have to have any further uh, complications. So um, he's also going to talk about um, a, a fantastic woman, and some of you probably know her too, not far from here, a handful of hours north, uh, uh, Tracy Murphy from Asa Sanctuary. Does anyone know about that case? So you'll, you might know if I might be sharing. Two cows wandered onto a sanctuary property. This is no bullshit. This is serious. Like, like, where could they have gone? There. No better place. And it's legit. It's, it actually would happen. What was she supposed to do? What would you do if you were in an orphanage and the kid runs in from getting beat? Like, are you going to know? So she's being brought up on charges. The community is horrible to her. This is a big, you know, this is a pharma community, a, a, a livestock community. So Wayne generally just hangs out on the beach and doesn't do a lot. <laughs> so, you know, he said, I have some extra time. And with his graciousness and, and his incredible skill, he is representing um, Tracy and, and, and helping her in court with her case. <laughs> So, I don't want to waste any more time on this, which is all to give a really beautiful, rowdy, happy welcome to Mr. Wayne Shum. Yeah, Ray's, Ray's been a good friend to me, and more importantly, the animals for many years. And I know all of you have been too, so I'm excited and grateful. And my energy is already picking up. I've, I've slept, I think, less than 10 hours in the last three or four days. Um, so I'm pretty exhausted, but being around good people like you always gives me a boost of energy. But, but as Ray said, I've gone through some challenges in the last year, and uh, what he didn't say is that I'm already a convicted felon. I went to trial in a case in North Carolina, a county called Transylvania, of all county names, where apparently they're very interested in blood, uh, because when we tried to prevent two very sick and injured baby goats from being probably just honestly disposed of, but if not sent to slaughter, were convicted of two felonies by we, I mean me, but you know, uh, the movement was affected by this conviction. And so I was a convicted felon when I was going to this Utah trial. And for those of you who don't understand our legal system, when you're already a convicted felon, and you get charged with more serious felonies, it starts adding up a lot. And at the beginning of this case, when they initially charged it, they charged us with four class two felonies in the state of Utah. And class two felonies are the second worst type of felony in the state of Utah. So you got the murderers and then you got me, the guy who walked into a factory farm and took out two sick baby pigs. They went from asking for potentially decades in prison to facing a maximum of 10 years in prison in this trial that began at the beginning of October in 2022. And we heard to the grapevine that Smithfield was asking for a minimum of five. Um, so we knew this was all very possible when we went to trial. And when I was leaving, um, my dad was actually, who's you know, elderly, 75, he's diabetic, he's honestly getting up there, he's had quite a number of health problems over the last couple of years. He was talking to me, and this is someone who, from the day I was born, taught me almost everything I know about generosity. He was this sort of guy who, we grew up as immigrants in central Indiana. Not many Chinese people in central Indiana, let me tell you that. And so when there was another Chinese family that came, we were the family that would bring them into our homes, um, give them money, give them aid. We had so much ourselves, but my dad was always so generous and the sort of guy who'd just give you the shirt off his back if you asked him for it. So he's taught me a lot about generosity over the years, but when I was leaving for Utah, you know, my dad knew I'd turn down a plea bargain. Um, which had basically a requirement that we would refrain from criticizing Smithfield for three years, which would have undermined the activism I'm trying to do. But that's what Smithfield wanted, the company that was trying to prosecute us. And, and he said to me, you know, Wayne, you've given too much. You've got to stop. You're about to run into a buzzsaw. And 
You've got two nieces, a family that needs you. My health is declining. If you go to prison for the next five, ten years, you never, you never see me again. And so when I left, I left my nieces, my sister, my cousins, we all lived in the barrier with a lot of tears. All very sad. Uh, but I think the family also understood. Because it's not just the human family members who were depending on me. It's the non-human family members, too. And, and all the furry kids I've got, I've got a cat who was abandoned on the street, on the streets of Chicago, would have been killed by the state if not for the fact that I happened to come across her when I was volunteering at the animal shelter while I was in Moscow. I've got a dog who is a livestock animal. His name's Oliver, and I pulled him out of a dog meat farm myself from a place called Yuling, China. There's no one no Yuling. Everyone says Yulin, but actually in Chinese it should be Yuling, because you were Chinese. But I know that I've got family members who live in a society where just because of who they are, because of the skin they were born into, have no rights, and in a moment's notice, the state or some powerful corporation or some court order comes down the wrong way. And this is true of dogs and cats as much as it's true of pigs, cows, and chickens. Read about the 60,000 dogs killed in experiments. Read about the dogs that are shot in police raids. The police come knocking on your door. Even if the search warrant is wrong, they shoot your dog and kill your dog. There's not going to be any accountability. At most, they might give you a few bucks because they killed the fur kid. Knowing what I know and seeing what I've seen about where my own kids came from, a shelter where thousands of cats were being killed every single year in Chicago, a dog meat farm in a city in China where in one week, 20,000 dogs are killed because people like the taste of their flesh. I knew I had to go. I had to go to this courtroom, I had to fight for the animals, and I had to speak our truth. And, and something pretty magical and honestly unexpected happened. We spoke our truth in that trial, and we won. And I'm here today to explain to you why. Um, so let me back up, though, and, and give you the fuller context, because <clears throat> I shared with you a little bit about the risks that we took in going to trial. Um, but you're probably wondering, why did the state prosecute in the first place? If, for those of you who don't know, much about the facts of this case, even what you heard today is probably a little shocking. I'm going to shock you even more. Even by the state's own account, the two piglets we removed were worth at most about $42 each. And for these two piglets that were worth, by the state's own account, $42, our own government with your taxpayer dollars spent likely millions of dollars prosecuting us harnessed at least a few dozen FBI agents across state lines, raided two separate animal sanctuaries, threatened elderly women who were there to care for orphan and abused animals with serious felony charges, arrested and charged five of us, threatened us with class two felonies, and tried to shut an entire movement for animal rights down. And you might ask why? You know, for two piglets they're worth 42 bucks. Why were so many FBI agents and armada of four SUVs crossing state lines? It's almost like something from some silly kids cartoon, you know? Sounds like it's stranger than fiction, but it, it actually happened in real life. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit why. And, and the reason is there is an incredibly powerful industry that all of you know about if you're in this room today, the animal agriculture industry. And this industry has a lot to hide. And specifically in Utah, the things that they were trying to hide. At the largest pig farm in the nation is a place called Circle Four Farms. About 30 miles west of the nearest town, Beaver, Utah. The entire county only has about 5,000 people. The nearest town only has a few hundred. And out here in this factory farm that is 30 minutes driving, it's about 20 miles by 20 miles, massive facility with 80 separate sets of enclosures, 1.2 million pigs each. In this factory farm, 30 miles west of Beaver, Utah, what they were trying to hide was perfect cruelty that's so vile and evil that when you describe it, it sounds like it can't be true. So let me just give you some demonstrative examples of the things that we saw so before. Um, before you even walk into the farm, the first thing you hear and see and smell is death. But you hear the screams of death because the animals, when you have 1.2 million pigs, and anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of them are dying even before they get to slaughter. A lot of screams of agony and death every time you drive in. You smell the smell of death too. Um, 
even 30 miles away when the moon blows west from Circle 4 Farms into Beaver, people in that town say, and they've said to us, that the snow gets so bad that we can't even go outside. We've got to close up our doors, lock up our windows, even with 95 degrees in the Utah desert. It's so unbearable we can't even step outside. And when you walk up to one of the farms, you'll see these massive dumpsters, you know, industrial scale dumpsters. And you wonder, what's inside? And when you peek inside, you see corpse after corpse after corpse, piled up, taller than a human head, of piglets and pigs who haven't made it out of one. So when you're raising 1.2 million pigs in spaces where, for example, the mother pigs that are 600, 700 pound animals, we're each getting about 14 square feet of space, where the animals are living face to face, row to row, right next to each other, on a scale of hundreds of thousands, or in the Circle Forest case, over a million. Where every one of the animals is a commodity, where at most, you know, they're worth maybe a few dozen bucks when they're piglets, um, and certainly you're not going to be able to give them appropriate veterinary care, you're going to see a hell of a lot of death. And when the farmers walk through the facilities, and there's not many of them, because after all, that's expensive to hire a lot of farmers to care for 1.2 million animals. When they walk through these facilities every day, once or twice a day, um, or less in some cases, the main thing they're looking for is dead and dying animals. The dead animals, they throw them in the landfills, and it came out in our trial through discovery that even in one landfill, and we believe they have many landfills, in one landfill every year, guess how many pounds of dead pigs, not live pigs that are being sent to slaughter, how, guess how many pounds of dead pigs they're throwing away and abandoning? even before they get to slot. Anyone want to guess? A million pounds. million pounds? Any other guesses? 20 million pounds of dead pigs every single year in a single landfill in several mm -hmm. farms. That is why there's the smell, the sound, and the sight of death. And when you see these landfills, they're massive huge lagoons of just decomposing corpses after decomposing corpses. And for the record, this is not just a horrific infliction of injustice on animals. These landfills, because they're often not properly sealed, because they're not properly treated, when the rain falls, which it does fall, even in southern Utah in the desert, guess what leaches into the ground? All the disease, the chemicals, the bacteria, the feces, the blood, the decomposing flesh ends up in the water that but uh, the lucky animals, frankly, are the ones that die in a landfill. Mm. And the ways they die, and this is one of the things I'm trying to cover up, and these are all just standard practices. You can go to veterinary manuals for the livestock industry. This is not something exceptional or extreme that animal rights activists are trying to give you for propaganda. You can actually pull it directly from the livestock instruction manuals at places like Circle Floor. There are two common causes or two common ways they will euthanize the animals before they throw them into these landfills. 20 million pounds of dead pigs. Does anyone know some of these practices? Yes. Gassing is one. And what's the other? Suffocation, right? Gassing and suffocation are the same. Ventilation and raising. So that's usually in a, an emergency situation. So but the standard practice of euthanasia are thumping. Yeah. So the two most common methods in these pig farms, standard practices in the industry, are gassing them. So you pile up piglets, and one of the documents we obtain. This is from Circle Foreign's own veterinarian inspecting their own facility. One of the documents we found was a document that uh, was a report from one of Circle Foreign's own veterinarians saying, hey, hey, you know, we're gassing piglets, but not only gassing them, but we're piling them up, not just one, not just two, but three live piglets high in the chambers. They are stepping on each other kicking each other in the face and squealing as we gas them death using CO2. And this is a violation of not just common sense and anyone's ordinary moral intuitions, it's actually a violation of the company's own policy. It is criminal animal cruelty, a violation of Smithfield's own animal welfare policies. All right, so this is, this is standard practice, CO2. And furthermore, for those of you who have not read you know, the veterinary research on CO2 gassing, and it is gassing, it's not euthanasia. Euthanasia is a euphemism the industry uses. Even from the industry's own peer-reviewed research on gassing, 
which they're concerned about because if animals thrash around and writhe in agony, sometimes they damage the flesh. Right? So you have to think about, okay, and for gassing piglets, at least piglets are not going to throw in the landfill, which is one of the common ways they slaughter animals or stun animals before they're sent off to be eviscerated on the slaughter line. One of the problems of CO2 is it doesn't actually lead to a peaceful, quiet death. Because animals can actually sense they're not getting oxygen when they breathe in CO2. And one of the ways they know that is because CO2 dissolves into water. Into what? Who knows their chemistry? Carbonic acid. Carbonic acid. Carbonic acid. And I dare you to go to a chemistry lab and pour some carbonic acid on your hand, much less into your mouth and your lungs. You're not going to have a very happy day, my friends. And every single one of these poor, gentle piglets, already sick and injured and scared and distressed, they are thrown into a terrifying black box, in some cases piled up three high with living, writhing creatures, and then pumped into that black box of darkness as they're screaming and scared, is a gas that is going to form carbonic acid in their lungs, burn their respiratory tracts as they slowly suffocate to death. This is one of the things the industry is trying to hide at Circle Four Farms. Um, so one, one big cluster, and I can say so many more things of the things we saw. And we saw the piglets that had been gassed. We saw the gas chambers at Circle Four Farms. And there's just an expose in the last week that DXC did of the gas chambers at other slaughterhouses. There's a big slaughterhouse in Southern California called Farmer John. It's the largest slaughterhouse in the Western United States. It does about 2.5 million pigs. It does. They don't do. They kill 2.5 million pigs every year. And they claim their slaughter process is humane. They've said CO2 poisoning. These animal rights activists are lying to you. It's all propaganda. Um, you can actually go on Smithfield's website. Do it yourself tonight if you want to confirm this. Look up Animal Care Smithfield. And you can see how they describe the slaughter process. And they say... They go gently into the night. Yeah. Um, I think the way they call it is they, they don't even describe it as slot. They say it's anesthetizing the animal, so CO2, anesthetizing. And I dare you to find any doctor in the world who says poisoning a creature with CO2 gas that forms carbonic acid in your lungs is anesthetizing. But this is their market. But for a long time, and, and, and frankly, you know, the movement, in part, is culpable for this because we're the ones who actually encourage them. Let's use CO2 stunning. I don't like the thumping process. Thumping, the other process they use is in many ways even more brutal because thumping is just grabbing a little baby, you know, not, not like the kids in this room, grabbing a little baby by their hind legs and smashing their skull into concrete over and over again as they scream in agony. I've seen this process. I've heard it. I have talked to Smithfield employees myself. I have a friend or friend of me, Brett Johnson, who worked at a Smithfield farm where they were raising piglets in nurseries, and he himself is a worker at Smithfield who was sending thousands and thousands of piglets to their death. He said he was traumatized from having to pick up these baby animals and crush them by their skull on concrete. But partly because so many people were upset about thumping, partly because so many people were upset about the use of captive bolt guns or electrocution to slaughter animals in places like Farmer John, Smithfield and other big companies said, we're going to do the right thing. We are going to use controlled atmosphere stunning and controlled atmosphere killing. And so when you go to Smithfield's website today, when you see CO2 stunning, CO2 gassing, stunning isn't even the right word, it's a gas chain. It's a gas chain. But when you see the way they describe it, they don't even describe it as slaughter or stunning. They describe it as anesthetizing. As if you're going in for a medical procedure. It's going to be so sweet. These people are caring for you. They're trying to reduce your pain. What is anesthesia? It is reduction of pain. And until last week, no one had actually seen the inside of one of these gas chambers. My friend Raven Deerbuck, an amazing activist and investigator, snuck into one of these facilities, crawled down 25 feet into the gas chamber where all the pigs are lowered into before they're stunned and slaughtered and eviscerated. Put a camera in there. And I encourage all of you to watch it, even for five seconds yourself. You cannot watch this for even five seconds and say this is remotely humane. In fact, it is so horrific that a veterinarian who worked for the industry at the AVMA, the American Veterinary Medical Association, which is an association that has been better in the industry 
for probably 100 years, since the founding of the APMA. They've been in bed with the industry. One of the veterinarians who works on euthanasia was on the board of euthanasia for the AVMA, Industry Association. Watch this video footage, and he himself said, I'm watching this, and I can no longer eat pork until this has been fixed. Okay. So this is why. Why are they so upset? Why are they sending FBI agents across the country? Why are they threatening you with decades in prison? Sanctions are usually reserved for people who murder people, you know? People, even mass murderers sometimes don't get as many felonies as we got. And the first reason is because they know there's violence against animals. And that when people see them, even people who work for the industry, they not only recognize the industry is lying to us, they recognize that their values can't be aligned with what this industry is doing to gentle creatures. So, that's one of the lies and one of the things that they're trying to cover up that led them to prosecute us, punish us, and try and intimidate anyone else from doing something similar to what we did at Circle Four Farms, which is bring in cameras, bring in a VR rig, and show people what's happening. So, second thing, and second reason the state came after us in this prosecution, uh, can really be captured in a three-letter acronym, P-E-D. It stands for a lot of things, but anyone know what PED means in the context of a factory farm? And particularly a pig farm? So PED is something we should all know because um, in terms of the number of sentient beings who suffered and died in the last 10 or so years, we've all heard of COVID-19, obviously, hopefully, but has anyone not heard of COVID-19? Where have you been if you haven't heard of COVID-19? PED like COVID-19, is a coronavirus. It stands for porcine epidemic diarrhea. And like COVID-19, PED is a very, very dangerous coronavirus. And cumulatively, across the country, it is quite likely that PED has killed at least millions, and very likely tens of millions of pigs across the entire nation, starting in about the early 2010s. And PED is not only dangerous to pigs, and a cause of great losses at factory farms. But for those of you who don't know about swine biology, so my dad, um, much to our family's shame, and I will say to my dad's credit, he's, as I said, a very generous person. He's an open-minded person. He's become a great supporter of animal rights and now contributes as much to the movement as really anybody I know. But my dad, when he first came to this country, was a scientist who worked on diabetes and other metabolic diseases. And one of the animals he worked with a lot was pigs. And why would you use pigs in studying human disease? Because it turns out pigs are very similar to us. You probably heard about the organ transplants from pigs to human beings. Pigs and their biology is very similar to us. And what that means is that when there is a disease that is killing tens of millions of pigs across the country, if there are very, very small and minor mutations in that disease, that lead the disease to jump to human beings, that disease can very quickly start killing tens of millions, if not hundreds or billions, of human beings. If you don't believe it, many of you have probably heard of another great pandemic in American and global history called the Great Flu of 1918. So we're not sure exactly. Could have been chickens. But some of the best evidence suggests that that great flu that killed probably at least 10 times as many people on a per capita basis as the coronavirus has killed over the last few years probably came from a pig farm. Probably came from a pig farm. And yet little known to this country, while we're all concerned about COVID-19 and worried about you know the 1% or maybe 0.5% death rate of COVID-19, as, as tragic and awful as it is, I'm not trying to minimize the impacts of COVID-19, a disease that's killing maybe 20% of the pigs and is much more infectious all across the nation is wiping out herds by the tens of millions in this country and around the world. And we don't hear a word about it. So when you walk in a circle, when you watch the trial, many of you, did anyone watch the trial? Okay. So there was, there was a part where the veterinarians were talking about diarrhea. It was like kind of a, in many ways, a comical conversation, because how often do you have like long conversations and questioning of diarrhea 
and whether diarrhea is explosive horizontal diarrhea or normal vertical diarrhea. So in our court case, the, the big dispute was, did the piglets have explosive diarrhea? And why is that? Because when you have a virus spreading throughout your entire digestive tract, preventing your digestive tract from properly digesting food to the point that you know, your intestines are falling apart, your stomach is falling apart from the inside out, and all the food is just rushing right through. When you have these very serious infections, sometimes bacterial, in this case viral, you have what's called explosive diarrhea. The diarrhea comes out horizontally. It doesn't even come out right. And one of the reasons the people at Circle Four Farms and Smithfield and their allies and government didn't want us talking about things like explosive diarrhea, which both of these piglets had at Circle Four Farms, is because they knew that would start a conversation about why are we producing food that is creating viruses that are leading the deaths of tens of millions of animals? Why are we producing food that is mutating viruses and spreading viruses in intensely confined circumstances more rapidly than any other context on the face of the planet Earth? The Johns Hopkins School of Medicine did a study of pandemics in industrial animal agriculture. And the director of that research study um, has a quote in Wired Magazine, you can look at this up yourself. And he called factory farms super incubators for pandemic viruses. Super incubators. So if you wanted to biologically, physically engineer a system to create more dangerous and lethal bacteria and viruses, you could not do better than a factory farm. This is what you would do. If you were some evil genius and you wanted to wipe out the human species, you would say, yes, let's create a huge number of extremely sick and distressed animals that have biology very simple to us. Their biology is very similar to us. And it's easy for viruses and bacteria to jump from them to us. Let's confine them right next to each other. Let's dose them with huge amounts of antibiotics so the drugs keep inoculating themselves against the viruses and bacteria, and the bacteria and viruses just keep stronger and stronger and stronger in every generation. Let's slaughter them very quickly and produce them again and slaughter them really quickly and then produce them again and you will create a super bug, a virus or bacteria that doesn't just kill thousands or millions of Americans, but could kill tens of millions or billions across the world. And if you don't believe me, read about the Black Plague. The Black Plague wiped out like 40% of the entire planet Earth. It really caused a collapse in human civilization. And the Black Plague, like most pandemics, was a zoonotic bug. A zoonotic bug is a bug that jumps from non-human animals to animals, or to human animals. And what Circle Forest didn't want people to know is that there were viruses and diseases and zoonotic bugs, and potential zoonotic bugs, that with very minor genetic mutations could have jumped to the human population and killed millions of Americans. Uh, this is not just speculative. Right? It's not just speculative. Because even as Circle Four was constructed, and even as, as there were you know, the, the diseases they already had. Um, Millard County, Utah, which is an agricultural county that is dependent on the industry, they did a public health study of digestive and respiratory disease after Circle Four Farms was constructed in the early 1990s and found extremely elevated levels of respiratory and digestive diseases, especially in children. And they didn't ultimately find a cause, a cause for this elevated risk of disease. And if you read the report, you can look it up. Like just read it, Millard County, M-I-L-A-R-D County, Public Health Report, Circle Four. They had all these scientists come and do this big study. And the conclusion of the study is, hey, this is really concerning. We need to look into this more and find out what is causing this. Because right after the farm was created, all these kids are getting sick. And let's do some further research. Guess what the government did in response to that report? They didn't do any further research. They ignored it completely. And this is what Circle Four and Smithfield didn't want you to know. So that's the second thing that they were trying to cover up. They didn't want the world to know. And the second reason they went after us so hard to try and shut us up and scare us from doing this with you. But the third reason they came after us, which is in my view the most important reason, is this. That when people see these truths, they see animals suffering from disease, animals being gassed up and writhing in agony in the moments before they die of carbonic acid burning in their respiratory tract in their lungs. When people see these truths, people, including non-vegans, 
including people in rural areas, including right-wing people, for all those of you judging people in Utah, <laughs> people everywhere, when they see these truths, they have compassion. They have compassion. And that is probably the most important thing. The industry and the government didn't want the world to know. So, if you don't believe me, I'll give you just a couple stories. One is, when we traveled around Circle 4 Farms, and in Beaver County, and Washington County, and Miller County, Utah, uh, you might think a county like Beaver, where 25% of the employees in that county work for Smithfield Foods, so one out of four people, and even the people who don't work for Smithfield Foods, you know, if you live in a county where one out of four people works for the company, whether you work at a school teacher, you work at a restaurant, you work at a Walmart, it actually isn't even a Walmart in Beaver County because it's too small. I mean, like, too small for a Walmart. Who would have thought? Almost everybody's kind of dependent on this company. And so you might think that people would, almost by necessity, be inoculated to stories of animal suffering. Uh, but it turns out not many people actually work inside the farms. You know, people work in business and transit, fuel, grain, whatever it is, in the restaurant nearby. In almost universally, even in Beaver County, Utah, at gas stations, at subways, when we actually showed people, this is even before you were prosecuted, when we actually showed people video footage and photos, including photos of baby pigs collapsing the ground, starving death and rotting death, right behind their mothers who are trapped in these gestation crates, in cages so small the mom can't even turn around and check on the babies that she's just given birth to were slowly and agonizingly dying. Almost universally, People were horrified. Um, another story. Got a, a friend who lives in Salt Lake City who's born and raised in Beaver County, Utah, the very county where Smithfield Foods was, was owned uh, and ran. And when we started this investigation, she was one of the people who really pushed us and supported us in doing it, a Beaver County native. And one of the reasons she and other people who are family members the workers at Smithfield, or who are workers at Smithfield themselves, people like Brad Johnson, I'll tell this story in another day. He's a Smithfield employee, or was a Smithfield employee in North Carolina. Even they themselves, the people who work for the company, were telling us things like, you know what? I'm not sure I'm down with raising a 600 pound animal in a two foot by seven foot box. And by the way, I thought our company promised to do away with this. Am I going to get in trouble for working in this company when they promise the public we're no longer going to trap these mother cave, mother pigs in these two foot by seven foot metal cages? I'm coming to work every day and I'm saying we're still doing that. And so you had people even working for the industry coming to tell us. But the best proof, of course, is what actually happened at trial. Right? When we actually showed eight members of the public in Washington County in a conservative, rural, Mormon region of this country, they came through. They said, we don't want our species to be tormentors of animals. We want to be caretakers of animals. When they saw the truth, they took a stand for compassion. And that, that is the thing, more than anything else, that the Smithfields of the world, the Tysons of the world, want to suppress and hide. Because if people who see the truth, act of compassion, in their diets, in their politics, in their votes, in their dollars, then the world changes. And the slaughterhouses and factory farms disappear and are replaced by shelters and sanctuaries. So those are the three things I think they they were trying to cover up, and the three reasons they exhausted such tremendous resources in trying to put five nonviolent offenders who did nothing more than walk into a building, no property destruction at all, take some photographs and two sick baby pigs. Um, and even though we have a lot. You know, of arguments and facts um, and intuitions to defend ourselves. It was going to be a very, very hard battle, not just because Smithfield is a multi-billion dollar corporation, the single largest pig farming corporation in the world, not just because they have enormous political influence and donate millions of dollars to politicians across the country, especially in places like North Carolina and Utah where they have large pig farming operations, but because Partly due to this influence, they successfully convinced both the state of Utah, I'm prosecuting this case, and the judge who was overseeing the case, to die, deny us the opportunity to present any of these facts that I just shared with all of you. We're not able to talk about the condition of the piglets at Smithfield Foods. We're not allowed to talk about PD 
Many of you probably heard about PD for the first time today, even if you closely follow the trial. Because we're not allowed to talk about the fact that we're trying to expose these horrific diseases that are killing off millions of piglets across the country and potentially endangering our children and our immune com compromised uh, members of our communities as well. In fact, we were not even allowed to share the very video that we ourselves shot of the actual rescue. So the state is accusing us of a crime based on this action, saying they went into that farm and they stole property of value. And the state and Smithville were the ones arguing, oh, but don't, don't actually show the video what they did. We can't, we can't honestly see that. Um, we'll just like describe it for you and, and, and make sure he can't testify about it. because if he testifies about it, that's not kosher either. But just trust us. I promise you, they stole something. Um, but don't look at the bit. The judge and the prosecutor and so we went exactly into this agreed that because the video footage and photos we had shot would, according to one of the briefs that the prosecution filed, potentially arouse horror in the jury. Now, this is their language, not ours. Well, not, the prosecution not is arguing this is that it's so language. horrific and we and can't let anyone see it. Because if we let people see it, then they might actually make a decision of conscience and let these guys go. So one of the reasons we went into court, we were very pessimistic about our chances. And actually, um, we actually had a actually asked jury members. Come out. Got you know, some them, I think some of them are going to be trial, trials, so I'm going to go hang out with them. And, uh, one of them is actually, I don't want to say too much, one of them is actually dropping off that place. But anyways. So, I, I, I had not asked my lawyer, a lot of you didn't hear from my lawyer because I represented myself in trial. But my lawyer is an amazing woman. Long time appellate attorney, criminal Outfit defense attorney, usually works for like falsely accused people are saying in the known laws who have been in prison for 30 years and she's trying to get the evidence that they need, she needs to prove these people are actually innocent. So, I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's a class of beings that matter less in our society than animals. It's probably like convicted felons. Most people don't like murderers and and rapists. And we always assume they're they're rightfully charged. Like, even though, I mean, if you look at the evidence, there's actually an enormous number of people. It's like and hundreds, if not thousands, sometimes falsely have some sort of mental disability. They mostly because they're the poor, or even accident. Yeah. So this is who Liz, my attorney in Utah, usually represents. In this case, she was representing the animals. And even someone who's seen a lot of hopeless cases. Again, she represents poor black people or mentally disabled who have nowhere. with all to defend themselves. They're facing the combined power of the federal and state government, have been in prison for 30 years, and are just trying to you know, make their case to the public and, and to the jury and say, like, I didn't do it. I'm not, I, I, didn't, I didn't do it. I didn't actually ask her. And she, she was not used, optimistic about very difficult case. And I asked her, and she was begging me, like all our attorneys were, just take a deal, Warren. take a deal. Like, take a deal, take a few years in prison, take another convict, take another felony of records, don't go to trial because you're going to go away for a long time. You know, for 10 years. And ask her, what did you think about a prospect? And the word she used was, and actually laughed. She said, you know, honestly, my feeling was hopeless. That's her word, not mine. Because, and, and the reason she felt hopeless was because if we were not able to describe the what folks, we saw, the judge even why we were there. In fact, not, not only were we not allowed to show the motive, motive right? because they, they thought, if the jury even hears your motive, that could arouse so much horror and sympathy in them that they won't make a decision based on the law. They'll realize, well, the truth, that you were there just to try to do the right thing. You were not there to hurt anyone. You were just there to try to do the right thing. So Liz said, it's hopeless. Uh, and so, you know, this hopeless scenario, we're not able to tell our story, and the jury is going to hear this very discombobulated narrative about these two random guys Actually, five in total, but three of them fled out of the case. These two random guys who, for some reason, don't know why they're in the middle of the night. They can't even see the photos of what they did because the judge isn't allowing it. I mean, it's kind of fair for Liz to say this is kind of a hopeless case. And so you're probably wondering, how the hell did you win? Um, so, and I think there are a few secrets from this trial that are useful not just in trial advocacy, but frankly in all sorts of persuasive advocacy that are really crucial for us in winning. And 
Don't worry about taking notes. Um, first of all, I think Kenna could be wrong. I'm probably wrong more than I'm right. Don't worry about taking any notes because there's a blog I wrote called The Secrets of the Smithfield Trial. You should go read afterwards if you want to recall some of these things. Yeah. Uh, but I think there are three things that really allowed us to win despite these obstacles. The Eastern first Baptist. is, we really too often people work. stay at the level of abstraction. very important whenever you get into the details. The details really matter. And, and we watched the video footage. We looked at all the discovery documents. We did our homework. And I'll, and I'll share for you, with you some examples as to how doing our homework allowed us to win despite these odds. Um, the second thing, uh, I think a lot of times, the second thing we do is engage in something we really explore our focus on what we believe, and we don't admit any mistakes, and we don't, we don't even want to think about our weaknesses and mistakes. And one of the things that led us to win, and the prosecution to lose in this case, is when we went into trial, we already knew all our points of weakness. We knew where they were going to attack us, and that was crucial to our ultimate victory. And so, you know, don't be one of those understanding what you've done doesn't wrong. admit anything wrong because it's ever wrong. And the third thing, and maybe the most important thing is, and this is contrary to the advice most lawyers will give you, we didn't actually focus much on the law. In fact, if you listen to my closing argument, I expressly told the jury, I don't actually want you to quit me on some legal technicality. It's important to get the details you right. Decision it's conscience. important to have good arguments. true of advocacy. Even yeah. more important than the facts and arguments you have are whether you're telling a good and powerful moral story. Because we are moral creatures. We want to live moral lives. And if someone tells us a good moral story, we'll often be persuaded that they're right. Doesn't mean you don't need a legal hook at all. You need a legal hook. But tell a good moral story. Make that central to your narrative. And all the other details will fold themselves out. Okay, so let me just explain each of these, right? Doing your homework. Um, so, factory farming is a very complex process. And one of the reasons it's complex is because these facilities are no longer farms, they are factories. And what is the defining feature of a factory? What did Henry Ford invent in this country? Cars, Cars except assembly lines. And the assembly line is, is crucial because it has what's called division of labor. Every person is taking a very small sliver, and they become very good experts in it. They're doing it over and over again. And if you look at a factory farm or slaughterhouse, this is true. Like if you look at a slaughterhouse, there's like a guy on the slaughter line, usually not just one guy. It's almost always a guy, usually an immigrant guy, often a poor, poor immigrant guy, whose entire job, day after day, for eight, 10 hours a day, is just like to rip an animal's liver out. That's all they do. Like ripping livers. I'm the deliver person. I just rip it up. Um, and because it's an assembly line, and in, in many ways it's become simplified for each individual, because each individual, they just kind of work and think, like, I'm the liver guy. I just rip livers out. Right? You know, I'm the guy who cuts the throats. I'm the guy who, like, low, presses the button to lower the animals in the gas chamber. Or in the case of a cattle slaughterhouse, I'm the guy who holds a bolt gun and shoots the cow in the head after they're pinched into the tube that confines their head and gives it to all I see is cow heads, and I smash them with a captive bolt gun. Well, in many ways, it's become simple for each individual. The process as a whole has become many, much more complicated, right? And very few people understand that entire process. For example, pig breeding. Um, it turns out it's a lot, there are a lot more stages than most people understand. Anyone know the difference between gestation and farrowing? Have you heard these terms before? You've heard gestation crates, right? OK. Anyone know the difference between a gestation and a farrowing crate? Does anyone know what the term farrowing means, just colloquially? And so farrowing is giving birth. Do you know what the word gestation means? What is gestation? Breastfeeding or pregnancy. Pregnancy. Gestation is developing a baby before they give birth. Right, so gestation facilities and farrowing facilities, they sound very similar. Everyone kind of knows, I think this has to do with pregnancy and birth in some way. And in fact, even the crates are very similar. They're exactly the same size. They're both two foot by seven foot crates. They both look like, like claws. They're one of the most terrifying things about factory farms is just like how evil everything looks. If you go to the slaughterhouse in Tar Heel, the largest slaughterhouse in the world, 
it just looks like some evil fortress from some sci-fi movie where it's like, oh my god, that's like the evil place because there's like smoke coming out of it, it smells awful, there's like screaming inside, it just sounds like and smells like and sees. You look at it, it just looks like some sort of evil fortress of doom. But Farron crates and gestation crates are one of these implements of doom, and they look very similar. Like if you just looked at a picture and you didn't know the difference between a gestation and fern, you're like, oh yeah, they're all crates. They're crates for mother pigs, right? Yeah, I don't know, what's the difference? And unfortunately, for the prosecution, they didn't do their homework, and they didn't understand the difference between these two things. We did, because we did do our homework. We had been doing our homework for years, in fact. And so, just as one trivial example, in a gestation crate facility, because the pigs are gestating their babies, they're not raising them or giving birth to them, what will you not typically see in a gestation barn? Piglets. Because the piglets are inside their moms. They're gestated. They haven't feraled yet. They haven't given birth. And the prosecution charged us with burglary of a gestation crate facility, alleging that we attempted to enter the building and steal piglets from a gestation barn, thinking there's no difference between a gestation and a feraling facility. But what did we just establish? That there are no piglets in a gestation barn, and you should expect no piglets in a gestation barn. So how can you possibly charge someone with felony theft and burglary for stealing something that it will not exist in that facility? Okay, so this is one example. This is one of the reasons the first charge got completely thrown out. Because the prosecution just didn't do their homework. They didn't even understand the terminology. They thought these two were the same thing. They weren't. Right, so this is one example of many. Throughout the entire trial, and I don't blame the prosecution entirely because, I mean, how many people understand all the crazy terminology in factory farms and all the weird implements? Because after all, you know, like, there's literally a guy, I don't even know what the guy's name is. He has actually a job title. But there's literally a guy whose job is just to delever animals and slaughter. So, so if, in a system that complicated, it's like not surprising. But because the prosecution didn't go through all the documents, carefully interview all their witnesses, and understand comprehensively the system they were trying to litigate on behalf of, they lost the fight, at least in that one charge. And there are many other examples throughout the trial. So my advice to you when you're doing advocacy is there are a lot of people who say on some abstract level, yeah, animals have rights and it's wrong to slaughter animals. I'm not saying you have to understand everything about a slaughterhouse. But you should understand some things. You should have some statistics in your head, like how many piglets are not making out alive out of a slaughterhouse. It's about 18%, by the way, that don't get to the final stage of slaughter. What are the most common causes of death inside of a factory farm? It's generally hypothermia, crushing, and starvation which is disturbing enough, like the fact that that's just factually what the industry itself says. And these details actually matter a lot. Because I told you at the beginning that one of the things that's really powerful about this trial and about animal advocacy is compelling stories. What makes for compelling stories? Compelling details. And how do you get compelling details? You do your homework. You do your homework. So you could spend an entire lifetime trying to understand all the intricacies and details and absurd and insane and terrifying facts about factory farms. And I'm not suggesting all of you go to a PhD in animal science and study gestation crates your entire life. What I am saying to you is do your homework at least pursuant to the 80-20 principle. What is the 80-20% principle? You can do about 20% of the work to get 80% of the value. So do that 20% of the work to understand in some detailed fashion these industries. Don't be one of those vegans who just doesn't understand anything about what you're Because this is what the factory farmers always say. Like when you talk to farmers about animal rights activists, they always say, these people don't know anything. And unfortunately, oftentimes they're right. We don't know much. I mean, we know the most important thing. And I'm not trying to diminish the integrity of our moral position, because our moral position is correct, regardless of whether we get the details right. But if we don't get the details right, we're not credible. And if we're not credible, we can't convince a jury, we can't convince anyone that our position is the correct one. So that's the first lesson. Do your homework. We did our homework in this trial, and because of that, we had very detailed and factual understanding of this entire case in a way that the problem. The second lesson I gave you, uh, find your weaknesses, right? Normally, we like to think about our strengths. You know, everybody loves some, like, meme that comes out that says, Vegans are the most sustainable people on the world, and veganism is gonna keep you healthier and stronger than anyone else. And we're like, yeah, fuck yeah, let's share that shit. This is awesome, let me read this again. Let me read this article about how awesome vegans are for a hundred times. Read that. it again, so again and again, and we read celebrate, it. we're really happy. Good. I'm not saying don't do that. That's great too, <laughs> read that, that's great. Um, yeah, I've got, a, I've got a big supporter of ours. I was just literally having a conversation about how I use way too much profanity and I've already failed. So, speaking of, 
focus on your weaknesses. You can all help me focus on my weakness. One of my weaknesses, and I blame being a lawyer, because I didn't, surprisingly, I didn't curse at all until I started becoming a lawyer. And when you surround yourself with lawyers, suddenly you're dropping that bombs left and right. Sorry to the kids. I don't think kids don't even know what that bomb is. So. They do, unfortunately. Because of people like me, people like me are corrupting our youth. No. So, but, you know, we love just talking about all the good things about veganism and animal rights, and we don't like thinking about our weaknesses. But one of the reasons we won in this trial is because from the day we started, even from the day we started our investigation, we were thinking about the attack vectors that the industry uses against us. So, for example, you should understand that when people do investigations of factory farms, one of the common criticisms that's almost always given of animal rights activists is that we violate biosecurity. Right? That we endanger the animals and the human population because, you know, again, you have, and, 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 and it's, it's not even the best argument, but it's a common argument. And it's one that unfortunately resonates a lot with people who don't know any better. When you have all these sick and confined and immunocompromised and weakened animals crammed in cages and crates standing right next to each other, coughing in each other's faces, like literally when you're a mother pig in a gestation crate facility and you're in a two foot by seven foot crate, right next to 4,999 other mother pigs, also in two foot by seven foot crates, and your faces are this far apart, you can, can't even move away from each other, even if you wanted to. Even if you fought and struggled as hard as you could, there literally is nowhere for you to go. You are stuck, row by row, face to face, every day of your life for five years. And when an environment like that, if somebody brings in a variant of a flu virus that happens again in the pigs, or a variant of an avian flu virus if you're going to an egg farm. It can spread very rapidly, kill all the animals, and that would be a disaster for the move. So when we even started this investigation, we started the Open Rescue Network in 2015, we examined all the attack vectors, the things the industry says about us, and we tried to make sure we're responding effectively. And so we actually looked at the biosecurity protocols suggested by companies like Smithfield and by the state veterinarian of Utah, the state veterinarian of California, and made sure we did even better. You know, they do coveralls where they wash them down and shoe booties that they wash down with an antibiotic and antiviral solution. We just use disposable, completely sanitized shoe covers and coveralls that we only use one time and threw away every time we win it. But this is. One example of the many things we thought about that other activists had been attacked for, and we knew we had to do better. Right? The prosecution did not do this. They did not think about their weaknesses. So when they trotted out Graduate their state veterans in East Hampton, they thought this is what you were supposed to do. They, they were not thinking about their weaknesses. He's He's got got these they didn't think about the fact that he talked through his CV, which was extensive. He had done all this work as a veterinarian. It was a state veterinarian in the state of Utah. The word pig or swine did not appear a single time because they weren't thinking about their weaknesses. And so when I cross-examined the state vet, and I wasn't even sure. I, for all I knew, maybe he did have a lot of experience with pigs. I wasn't sure about it. But I knew that they gave us a CD where the words pig and swine did not appear a single time. So I went up to the state bed and I said to him, Dr. Taylor, you have a very distinguished career. I can see your CV. I think it was presented to us. Is that correct? He said, yes, it is. And looks like you've got a long line of experience, you know, all these different things you've done, all these animals you treat. And I said, yes. And it's also correct that the words pig and swine don't appear a single time on your CV, correct? And he's like, well, yes. <laughs> and what does that do to the jury who's listening to this veterinarian? Talk about how the, the pigs are well treated, the pigs aren't sick, they have commercial bodies. It immediately destroys his credibility with the jury. And they're thinking to themselves, we got a vet on the one hand, Tristan Rosenberg, who might not have all the credentials, and I might, might not be a powerful vigor in the veterinary industry who's been appointed the state veterinarian of the entire state of Utah. But on the other hand, she told us she cares for pigs every day of her life. And I went on further and I asked the state vet, it isn't true that if a veterinarian who has experience of animals, for example, on a daily basis, is going to have better opinions than a veterinarian who does not. He said, well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that the state of Utah and the prosecution were not focusing on their weaknesses. They're focusing on their strengths. They thought, we've got these people. We've got the video footage of those that did it. We've got a state veterinarian. Look how powerful he is. Look at him. They, they, they were kind of like the vegans who just think about how awesome veganism is and don't think about the critiques of veganism they need to respond to more effectively. And because of that, when they actually were faced a critique, they weren't ready. And the jury completely lost all credibility in the prosecution because they did not prepare for the weaknesses. We did. We did. We did things like have biosecurity in place. We cross-examined all of our witnesses at a time. Every single one of our witnesses got cross-examined probably a half dozen times. 
We pointed out to them all the potential weaknesses in their testimony so they were ready when they were hit with critique in the court. I'm getting so animated. Okay. <laughs> this is exciting. Okay, so that's lesson two. Don't just focus on your strengths, focus on your weaknesses and get rid of them. Um, and lesson number three is tell a simple moral story. And this is the advice I told you that most lawyers will not give you, which is the correct advice, not just for legal work, but for any sort of persuasive advocacy. Most lawyers will tell you that you have to do kind of what the judge says. And what the judge says is the elements of the offense are A, B, C, D. This is what you need to focus on. And maybe there's some defenses, and you can focus on X, Y, Z as well. But you work within the confines of the law. Maybe I've had other contexts too, where you know there's a discussion you're having with somebody, and you, you start talking about the animals, and maybe it pivots to some extraneous factor like, oh, but where do you get your protein? That's sort of thing. And what I will suggest to you is instead of getting distracted or pivoted away from the central narrative of animal rights, one of the things I've learned, and one of the reasons I started Direct Action Everywhere, you know. was that we believe that these moral truths, that the animals of, earth, of this earth, of 11 years of this earth, we just had our 10th year birthday, oh, just, that every oh, sentient being on a lot of birthday cake deserves a life of a lot of happiness. Old school folks come back and have immense happiness. Well, one of the things I've learned in the last 20 years about them, certainly in the last 10 years, since so we started DXC, one of the reasons we started DXC. Okay, so what do I mean by this in the context of the criminal trial? A traditional criminal defense usually focuses on sowing doubt in the jury, right? You know, did they really do it? And there was some of this. Like, you know, Paul's attorney was definitely like, because Paul didn't actually take any piglets out. There were plenty of photos. There was a video of me taking piglets out. But Paul was actually just a camera person. They charged him with it anyways. And so there was a little bit of this, you know? And that's what traditional criminal defense lawyers do. They're trying to sow doubt. Did he really do it? Or did he do it to the extent the prosecution is saying he did it? That is not what I did at all. And throughout the... The, the trial. My Same. focus is not on selling doubt on people or issues that were side issues. Again, it's not that the technical details don't matter, but the technical details that mattered most weren't technical details about the elements of the crime or defense or some extraneous fact. There were technical details that would help us tell a compelling moral story. Right? And so when we went to the jury, we said to them, and this is literally taken from my closing statement, your decision today is not just about the law. It will have consequences far beyond this courtroom, far beyond the impacts for me and Paul today. Because if you make the right decision, somewhere out there, there's a factory farm that's going to be a little bit kinder to the animals. There's a law enforcement agency that when they get a report of animal cruelty, instead of ignoring it, just like they always do, maybe they'll take some action to protect the animals instead of ignoring their abuse. And most important, most importantly, maybe, just maybe out there, there's a little piglet starving to death on the floor of the factory farm, just like Lily, who will be rescued instead of brutally murdered because of the decision you make today. Right? And even with the very limited evidence the jury got, just a couple photos and videos of a couple piglets walking around, stumbling, a little sick, a little weak, having some diarrhea and getting better in their care, that very simple moral story a challenge for this jury, that your decision has enormous consequences. If there is a huge challenge for you, which is this industry, the government is trying to gag you and prevent you from seeing the truth, but there is a sick and injured animal yourself can eat today. That was enough to inspire every single one, not just one, not just two, not just four, five, six, but every single one of these eight juries to say that you have the right to rescue sick and injured animals from factory farms. So, um, Again, just the last lesson I think of this trial, the, the last secret of this trial is you can get distracted in all sorts of orthogonal and, and secondary arguments. And I'm not saying these arguments don't matter about sustainability and health and protein and, you know, and like arable land and ecological footprints. And, and those things sometimes do matter. And I'm not saying don't be uninformed in those things because sometimes they can be a gateway to what I think is our most powerful weapon, non-violent weapon, I should say. But at the end of the day, I am convinced, and this trial is proof, that our most powerful tool is the very simple moral story.
that when animals are suffering, it is simply right to give them aid. Okay. So that's how we mark. Those are some of the secrets. Last thing I want to say before we conclude and maybe get some food. I'm getting really, really tired, so I'm sorry if my energy is fine. Is what's next? So we won one case. And in the history of the animal rights movement, uh, the animal rights movement has been around since, I mean, you could argue it's been around. Thousands of years, even going back to like, you know, uh, Pythagoras, who was a vegetarian, or, or Plutarch in ancient Greece, or the ancient Buddhist masters. One of the reasons I personally got involved in open rescue and was inspired to do open rescue is because I read, I read ancient Buddhist texts from um, Chinese scholars from like 1500 years ago saying that when you see an animal whose life is at risk, who is going to be slaughtered, you have a duty to intervene. You have a duty. Not even you can intervene, the right to intervene. It's not just the right to rescue, it is the duty to rescue. Um, but despite all this intuition that I think most of us have, and I think ordinary people have, that animals should be rescued and not killed, in the history of the animal rights movement, since 1975, when Peter Singer wrote the book Animal Liberation, with all the direct actions that have occurred, and there have been hundreds, if not thousands, of direct actions where people have liberated animals, tried to give animals aid, tried to free animals from cages, there's not been a single case where activists were outright acquitted. The jury unanimously said, no, we cited the activists and not the industry. But this case is not just an isolated case. But I'm here today to say to you, and I was saying this very early, and I just met her, but it's still terrible, because she's my host. I'm, my mom would be ashamed of myself, ashamed of herself. You don't even remember your host name. But what I'm here to say today, and this is the more, most important thing to take home, is that this case is not an anomaly. This case is a precedent. Mm -hmm. That if more people take the template we've used, and I don't mean necessarily even as part of direct action, it doesn't have to be part of any organization. But if you take the tools and knowledge and secrets that I've just shared with you, and you go out there and rescue animals yourselves, if in five or 10 years, I talked about all the hypocrisies and delusions and lies this industry tells. What is the antidote to lies and dishonesty and darkness? Truth and light. And if we go out there armed with our truth and light and rescue animals from these horrific abusive conditions and defend ourselves in the glare of truth and light in a court of law, even when they're trying to gag us, even when they're objecting, even when they're saying, you can't even talk about who you are and why you did what you did. This case is not an anomaly. It is a precedent. And in five or 10 or 15 or even 500 years, I don't think it's going to be fine. I think it's going to be more like 15 or 20. If instead of one acquittal, we have 100 cases across this nation getting coverage in the New York Times and the Guardian and the Wall Street Journal, if we have not just one major agricultural abusive company like Smithfield, but 100 companies all facing that same pressure and scrutiny, here is my promise. And it is a promise. It's not even just a prediction. It is a promise. My promise to all of you. If we can have 100 cases like this every single year, this entire abysmal, horrific, nightmarish industry will crumble on the weight of its own hypocrisy. And that's my last message to you and what I want every one of you to take home. That does not mean that every one of you has to risk what I risk. Right? But it does mean everyone has to risk something. Maybe your risk is... Is I'm going to donate a little bit more to someone who is rescuing animals. Maybe your risk is you're a lawyer, and I'm going to represent activists who are defending animals and defending the right to rescue in court. Maybe your risk is I'm going to volunteer a little more at that sanctuary because I know there are animals rescued from a fate worse than death at that sanctuary, and that sanctuary cannot sustain itself unless volunteers get out there, places like Ashafan. But if people do work together to defend the right to rescue, the right to give animals care when they need care, and if we have not just one, but a hundred cases like this across the nation, I just left you. This is your time. But not far from your own home. There's a case unfolding right now involving Tracy. And this is not just hypothetical, it is already. Also cares for animals. Because in your own state, actually, this is not. And for merely giving care, food, water, and shelter, what do you do when you see a poor baby walk up to your home? Well, if you're a good person, you help them. 
You give them water, you give them food, you give them shelter, shade in the scaling heat, warmth in the freezing cold. And because this woman who's devoted her, mission, her life, her life's mission is to give care to abort, abandoned, abused, orphaned animals, for giving these to animal care, they charge her with felony larceny, up to seven years in prison. They shackled her by her hands and her legs. They threw her in jail for a night, and they are trying to scare and imprison her. They are trying to scare and imprison all of us to stop us from doing the advocacy we did in Utah. But if we fight back in the court of law and in the court of public opinion, if we support people like Tracy and fight back, this will be another precedent, the next precedent in the right to rescue, and build us towards those hundred cases every year that if we can achieve that, will cause the entire industry to come. So there are a lot of needs that Tracy has, and I'm a lawyer for her, but I'm also helping her organize and communications because I have experience in a lot of things somehow. But we need an enormous amount of help in this case, but I'll just name three things concretely everyone can help us with right now. And you can talk to me right after. I can invite you to the next meeting we have to support Tracy in this right to rescue case, because this is a case involving the right to rescue, the right to care for animals. Because the state of New York and the US government, once again, is trying to criminalize the mere act of giving animals care. Can you believe it? We have so many problems in our society, inflation, climate change, homelessness. And the state of New York and our own government is using your taxpayer dollars to try and put someone in prison for giving animals care. She's not like me. She's not doing controversial activism. She didn't infiltrate someone else's property in the middle of the night. She just strolled up to our property after getting coffee one morning, saw two stray animals, and said, oh, I should give them help. And for that, she's facing criminal punishment and incarceration. But there's so many things we need to do to help. But I'll name three things. One is we're trying to create social media response teams, because part of the reason this narrative has not been as powerful as it could be is because Tracy, unlike me, has not spent a decade building up a network of activists, and followers, and supporters to amplify her story. And so Protect the Harvest, a nonprofit organization founded by Forrest Lucas, a billionaire rancher, has been spreading all sorts of false narratives about who Tracy is. She just wants to hurt the community. She doesn't even care about animals. This is just about fundraising. No one starts a sanctuary just to raise money, because it is a financial hellhole yeah. to run a sanctuary. Yeah. That is a terrible financial decision, yeah. and you are the worst investor in the world if you decided to start a sanctuary to make money. Because you're not going to make a dime, I'll tell you that. But the amount of lies that are being told about Tracy, and, but even though these things are lies, you have to remember, there are a lot of good faith people who believe these lies, even in rural areas. And if we go into these conversations on social media recognizing, look, I might be very different from this person in rural Niagara County, New York. But let me remember, there were eight jurors in Utah who just acquitted my friend Wayne, who believed in the right to rescue, but not because we attacked them, and not because they instinctively initially had that reaction, because every one of the jurors, and I met them all in Denver, not all, I met five of the eight in Denver just a few weeks ago, every single one of them said at the start, when I first heard about this case and in the beginning of the trial, I thought this is open and shut, this guy's going to jail, I mean, come on, he videotaped it himself. How could it possibly not be the case? But because we were thoughtful, because we were compassionate, because we did our homework and we told good stories, and maybe most importantly in the context of this persuasion, because we believed in these people, we believed that these people probably have compassion too. We were able to convince eight people in conservative rural New York to side with us. And you can too. So we need people on a social media response team that when people are saying all sorts of nasty things about animal rights activists and sanctuaries and vegans, you can come in constructively, non-violently, in turn people, use some of the lessons I just taught you in these social media conversations to turn people across the state of Europe and the nation in defense of the right to rescue and in defense of animal rights. That's number two is court support. One of the reasons I was able to continue litigating, because I have to be honest, you know, when I left my home in San Francisco, there were many tears because I thought I'm never going to see my cat again. I mean, he's 18 years old, he's very sick, and, and I cried. I'm, I'm going to sit on Facebook Live. I'm unashamed to show these things. Mostly because I'm so used to it now. It just doesn't affect me that much. But Tracy's not in the same position. Right? She doesn't have the same support that I do. Um, and I know it's been very hard for her. So we need people to actually come out to court with her and show her it's not just her against all these ranchers who are trying to kill her and doing donuts on her farm, posting signs right outside of her farm saying thou shalt not steal, making her feel bad every moment she walks out of her house. She needs people to support her. And the lawyers need people to support the team, too, more broadly. And so if you can be one of the people who's there in court support, or organizing other people in court support, that's fantastic and we need your help. And again, it's, it's probably about five hours away, so it's a little further, but a lot closer than me. You know, coming from all the way from California. It'd be like a 40-hour drive from me.
Um, and our next court date is on April 13th. You know, if you can't be there in person, you can still do court support on social media. Right? Just by amplifying the live streams, the photos, the memes, whatever we're creating, please tell Tracy's story, support her because she desperately needs it, and so do these two cows. So that's, that's point two. And then point three is campaigns. And this is where it gets a little darker, but it's all necessary. And that is that while in the long term, nonviolent movements, we believe that even our adversaries will be won over by the power of truth and light. And this is one of the things that King and Gandhi and Susan B. Anthony did so extraordinarily well. They believe so deeply in the goodness of their fellow human beings that even when someone was beating them, striking them, trying to send them to prison, they believe someday you too will be my sister and brother and the cause of justice, right? But, 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 well, in the long term, we should want to win over even the farmers and ranchers and CEOs and prosecutors. In the short term, it is crucial for us to call power. And the district attorney of Niagara County is the one who made the decision to harass, intimidate, and potentially imprison a poor woman merely for giving animals care. He is the one who could drop this prosecution on a second's notice. He could, today, just decide, you know what, let's not do this case. He's an elected official who responds to public pressure. And so we need people who are willing to strategically and non-violently put pressure on the district attorney to call on campaigns, email campaigns, Twitter campaigns, and even demonstrations outside of the office to ask this powerful elected figure, his name is Brian Seaman, his deputy is Laura Jordan, who's representing the state in this case, to put pressure on these institutions to do the right thing, to shine light on them. And when they do do the right thing, let's celebrate together. Let's bring them to the party too. But until these powerful people and institutions do the right thing, we need some big folks to help us put some pressure on them. So those are the three things we need help on right now. And all of you could help us with all three of them, or even just one of them. One is social media response, helping us with communications, and just joining a chat, and when we see something gone up, going up on social media that's false, that's harassment, just engaging nonviolent and saying to someone like Ed Pettit, one of her neighbors, who keeps saying, this is a thief, this is someone who doesn't care about anything, she's trying to hurt her community, and just responding nonviolent, saying, Ed, you know, I appreciate your perspective, but I've watched Tracy's live streams about this case. I know Tracy and her lawyers, and I know what this case is actually about. This case is just about whether animal care is a crime. What do you think of that? You know, we need people to engage in this way, so that all the people listening and watching all these social media posts and all these newspaper articles, and even the comments and newspaper articles, they can see that there is a different story that's not being told by the state, that's not being told by the industry, but that is being told by the grassroots. Two is court support making sure Tracy and her legal team are not completely decimated and destroyed by the trauma. And it really is kind of traumatic, getting shackled and thrown in jail when you've never been in jail before in your life. I know the first time it happened to me, I thought my life was over. I was a weeping, huddling mess for the next week of my life because I was a young, recent law student. I had just gotten a job at Northwestern University. I got thrown in jail within the first few weeks of my new job, and I thought my life was over. And that happens to a lot of people. Uh, and the best antidote to that depression and trauma is getting lots of support. So we need people to do court support. And then the third thing is we need people to campaign against the district attorney. Because the district attorney is inflicting a miscarriage of justice, not just on Tracy, not just on us in our community, but on the animals too. And we need someone to help us tell that story too. So uh, that's all I have to say. I'll open things up to question, and I think there's some food on the other side. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what questions and comments do you have? Quick question. Please. What's your name? Lisa Tarzi. Um, Thanks for coming, Lisa. Um, My pleasure. I'm an immigration attorney. Okay. I'm not an attorney. I'm sorry. Paralegal. I have my husband's the attorney, and um, uh, so I don't know much about criminal law. Yeah. Right? But what uh, do you ever see a case like this going up uh, in front of the U.S. Supreme uh, uh, Court? You ever see something, you know, the defendant loses and yeah. has the support and the ability to continue appealing yeah. to that level? Um, yeah, so the court cases have been crucial throughout American history and throughout social justice. And we all know the name Rosa Parks for a reason. And that was a criminal case, you know? And interestingly, that's a criminal case she lost. Most people don't know this. She was convicted, <laughs> she didn't win. Um, and that's because she had lots of support. But she did win where it matters, which there's a court of law and then there's a court of public opinion. In the long term, she won where it really matters. And the reason she won is because she had court support, because she had a communication team. You know, all the people in the black church were going out there telling the story of Rosa Parks, not telling the prosecution story, not telling the white segregation story, telling the true story of a woman who just wanted to sit on the bus. That's, that's all she wanted. She just wanted the basic dignity we all asked for as well. 
Um, Supreme Court cases have also been very powerful. You know, we know Brown versus Board of Education, Roe versus Wade. You learned this in middle school because the Supreme Court is a very powerful institution. But if you look at the history of social justice, a lot of these cases, including Rosa Parks' case, that have been crucial to driving forward progress, don't even get up to an appellate court. You know, because again, the courtroom that really matters is this courtroom. This is this matters. The conversations we've had with each other, the conversations you have on the street when you're doing vegan outreach. The conversations you have in the media when you do a protest and a journalist comes out and asks you why you were here. That courtroom matters even more than the court of law. And in that courtroom, it doesn't matter if it's the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals, or a trial court. It just matters that you have a good story. Right? Having said that, if we got at the Supreme Court, would I be happy? Of course I would. Well, it would be, be an amazing profile. Supreme Court. It would be incredibly high profile. But Rosa Parks in the Civil Rights Movement, Dale Jennings in the Gay Rights Movement, for those of you who don't know his name, read about his case. Dale Jennings was one of the first people who was out and proud and said, I'm gay and you can criminalize me and try and throw me in jail for this, but I'm not going to lie about this anymore. Um, he, actually was, he actually won his case, but only because the jury hung on a technical legal issue. So he won, kind of won. He was a hung jury. But 100%, if you look at the history of the gay rights movement, one of the reasons people started coming out, one of the reasons you have Stonewall. Has anyone heard of the Stonewall riots? Happened in 1968? I don't remember the exact year. But about a decade before Stonewall, Dale Jennings went to court and said, I am out, I am gay, and I am proud. And I'm not afraid to face even criminal consequences for that. And that inspired a movement behind him that led to Stonewall, the gay rights movement, and where we are today, where gay marriage is now a constitutional right. You go back to women's suffrage, Susan B. Anthony. Read about the trial of Susan B. Anthony, because before Susan B. Anthony went on trial, Women's suffrage and women's rights was not on anyone's radar. But there's something about the courtroom drama. The courtroom is the place where time immemorial, when our citizens have wanted to and needed to address some crucial social political issue, this is where a lot of the fights have started. It's not where they end. It's not where the most important debates happen, honestly. Because the courtroom is most important because it is an engine, a battery, for conflicts and discussion and persuasion and arguments and event eventually change in the courtroom that I actually manage, which is the court of public opinion. But it is a fulcrum, an engine, a battery for that sort of change. So to answer your question, yes, I would love that Supreme Court case. Let's try and get there if we can. If there's anything better than the acquittal we got in Utah, it would have been losing in Utah and then getting it multiple appeals up to the Supreme Court and then winning in the Supreme Court. That's a long and convoluted and difficult process. Let's take what we can get and let's fight in the court of public opinion where, where the fight matters most. But just one more question. Elisa. Let's go to someone else first, yeah. okay? okay. Unless, unless it's right on the same issue. Yeah, it is. It's, Please, quickly. Like you mentioned, it was a precedent-setting case. So that can actually, that precedent can be cited in a New York case? It can be cited as persuasive authority. Okay. Right? So when I say precedent, I don't mean legal precedent. Because, and again, the courtroom that matters to me is not actually mostly the court of law, even though I'm a lawyer. It's the court of public opinion. It's the court of the street. Um, and trial court judgments, especially jury judgments, are not legal precedent in the formal sense. But what they are, inevitably, is what lawyers call persuasive authority. And the next district attorney, the next judge, or even the next jury that litigates a case like this, I, I can already tell you, the other prosecutors around the country that are trying to put me in prison, and I do have some more criminal cases myself, and I'm certainly hoping you guys hear about and, and, and help with our defense in those criminal cases. All those judges and prosecutors and even juries are thinking about this case. 100% certain of that. Because I already know. You know, they, they told our defense attorneys, they said, yeah, um, what happened in Utah? That was wild. You know, but that was just one case. And to the prosecutors in the industry, they still see this case as an anomaly. We have to make sure that case is not an anomaly. It is a precedent. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, what's your name? Uh, Tushar. Tushar, nice to meet you, man. Nice Thanks for coming you. out. Thank you. Um, has anything happened to Smithfield since the trial in direct relation to the trial? For one, they're shutting down Circle 4 Farms. Yay. Uh, this started happening even before. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm clear if it is still the largest pig farm in the world, but as recently as 15, 20 years ago, it was reported as being the single largest pig farm in the world. And it's not all a victory because likely what's happening is they're shutting down Circle 4 Farms and expanding their operations in China. Spitfield, for those of you who know, is a Chinese corporation owned by one of the richest men in China, a guy by the name of Wang Long. Um, and you know, partly because, unfortunately, Chinese people are eating much more meat and they tend to eat pork. You know? And 
and partly because Chinese labor and environmental practices. Uh, I shouldn't say environmental. One, one strange thing about the United States is we like to think of ourselves as pretty progressive environmentally, but a lot of the things that pig farms allow to do in this country, they don't even allow in China. And China is a filthy place. Like, just get off the airplane in Beijing. Has anyone been to Beijing? Yeah. Did your throat hurt when you got off the point? I don't remember. I was 10. Okay. I don't think so. Okay. Well, go, go to Beijing now. I've been to Beijing it's recently. Stop, Most people who are not used to the air quality, I mean, it, it's, it's bad enough that you can feel that it's sulfuric acid because it's you know, sulfur dioxide in the air. Sulfur dioxide dissolves into H2O, it forms sulfur or sulfuric acid. It's not super you know, concentrated sulfuric acid, but it burns your throat. And like you feel like you have a sore throat the entire time you're in Beijing. So this is not a very environmentally friendly place. But even in China, they don't allow the factory farms to take all the feces and chemicals and disease from these manure lagoons and just spray them into the air. And they allow that here. They don't allow that in China. But in terms of labor, it's a lot cheaper to hire people in China. And the cost of living is a lot lower in China. So part of what's happening is Smithfield is probably just expanding the operations in China and will be exporting pork from China to the United States. But still, it is a victor. Um, and maybe, maybe even more important than these like physical, you know, logistical victories, though, is is the fact that Smithfield's reputation has been incredibly tarnished. The legislators and prosecutors who defended Smithfield, the um, the lobbyists who advocated for Smithfield, the the prosecutor himself, Vaughn Christensen, was in the media recently saying. That trial, where I tried to put Wayne in prison, has left me with PTSD. Right? And I hate PTSD, and I certainly knew he was exaggerating. He doesn't, well, I hope he doesn't actually have PTSD, because that's an awful thing for anyone to have. But that is, that is going to affect the Knox prosecutor who thinks about whether to prosecute an animal rescuer or whether to prosecute an animal abuser. And, and that, to me, is the most important change. That people are going to think twice next time they defend Smithfield and go after the animal rights activists who are trying to assist animals being tortured by Smithfield. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, please. What's your name? Michelle. Oh, I know. Michelle. Michelle? Can you remind me where the two cows are? Are they still with Tracy? So two, yeah. Sadly, the two cows were seized and taken away from her. Mm -hmm. What the prosecution has said in, said in open court is that they've been sold off for few days. And it's funny because, you know, the, the rancher in this case tried to construe and tried to convey, and this is one of the just examples of misinformation, and we need a social media team, not just me, not just Tracy, but more people out there sharing these stories. Because when, when he came to the farm, he actually brought his kids and made it seem like, oh, these cows are just our pets. You know, again, remember all the lies Smithfield was telling about, oh, the anesthetizing of these poor animals. They're not, they're not going to feel anything. They go to sleep as if you're in a hospital getting surgery. We're, we're literally anesthetizing. We're reducing their pain while they spray carbonic acid all over their lungs and cause these animals to slowly asphyxiate inside a gas chamber. Well, the lie that, that this rancher is telling is like, oh my god, these, these cows were our pets. My children is, are so upset about this, and, and they're crying. And he even brought his children with him. Like a, it was almost like a stunt. Um, and what does he do with these cows? He says, they're the beloved companions, and we, we're so attached, and we're so hurt they're taken from us. Within days, they're already gone. He sold them off to be, you know, we don't know exactly what. And, one of the courtroom fights we had just a couple days ago is we're trying to get information about where the cows are and, and potentially even to get them back and save their lives. Um, but right now, the district attorney and the judge feel no pressure at all because Tracy herself has been dragged in court. She's not allowed to speak about this case on social media. And that's why one of the reasons I'm out here today in New York and New Jersey because we need someone else to be her voice because she's been dead. But if, if we do a good job with this, you know, I think there's a chance the cows are still alive, and if they are still alive, there's a chance we can get them back. Okay. Yeah, what's your name? Hi, uh, Wayne. My name's Jeff. Jeff, nice to meet uh, you. Thank you for the talk. Sure. And uh, thank you for like taking that risk and yeah. going to trial and you know all this happened because of that decision. So you know, that took some really big balls from you. So thank you. We appreciate that. Well, it's a, it's a big team, and I think you know. Courage always comes in small steps, and courage always comes from communities, not from individuals. Everybody who's been brave, probably in the history of bravery, or the bravest people always have people behind them. And, and so thank you for the support, because I would have been brave enough to go to trial, not for the fact that people like you have my back. So thanks. So my question is, it seems like, uh, was there any like legal or basis for the judge to side with 
Smithfield in that all these restrictions were put on the defense for what you can and can't talk about. How and if there's not a, like a legal basis for that, how could the how could that situation be so biased against the defense? One of the little known perversities of the American criminal justice system is a concept called judicial discretion. <laughs> And what judicial discretion is, is the idea that in many wide and sweeping areas of law, a judge is more or less entitled to make arbitrary decisions just based on his own feelings that can have determinative impacts on, for example, someone's freedom. So there's a rule on the Utah Rules of Evidence, an equivalent federal rule, and also rule in most states, including probably New Jersey, and I know New York too, because I'm now representing <laughs> in rules of evidence, and sometimes even rules of substantive criminal law, where a judge has enormous judicial discretion to arbitrarily decide which way to go. And, and usually, and this is one of the great failings in the American criminal justice system, usually because judges are almost always former prosecutors themselves, including all of our Supreme Court justices with the exception of one, every single one of them is a former prosecutor, not a single one other than Justice Jackson, who was just nominated and approved to the Supreme Court. Only Justice Jackson has done any defense work in her life. So all of these judges are used to like putting people in prison and thinking everyone's guilty and, and thinking that victory means someone goes to prison. And only one of the judges has ever defended even a single person in a court of law. Right? And so because most judges are former prosecutors, their inclination is always when they have judicial discretion, they side with the prosecution. And that's what happened in our case. I will say our case is even more egregious than most miscarriages of justice though because again, Usually when Rule 403 is, is used, it's by a defendant who's trying to say, hey, don't show people the evidence of the murder victim, you know, because that's not really relevant to who killed her. Like it's, you know, maybe it's, it's relevant to the idea that someone died, but we can all agree someone died. Don't, don't show the body, because that's just gonna piss people off and they're gonna punish somebody. Usually judges deny the motions and allow the murder victim to be shown anyways. And defendants are like, oh my God, once again, the judge is allowing evidence that shouldn't be allowed. In our case, we were the ones desperately begging, saying, like, no, show the body, show everything. Show the jury everything. And the judge denied it. Um, or, or denied our request and approved the prosecution's request to exclude that evidence. So but there, there was a specific rule. Unfortunately, it is a rule that has such a big gaping hole of exceptions that the exceptions swallow the rule. So it's hardly a rule at all. It's basically carte blanche for judges issue their arbitrary and you know ad hoc decisions about who they like more in the trial. Okay, maybe one more question? Is that okay? And then we can go eat and do other things. One more question? Yeah, please. What's your name? Juliet. Juliet. Nice to meet you, Juliet. Thanks for coming. Yeah, nice to meet you. Um, you might have covered this already, but where are the states? Lillian, I don't remember the other. Yeah, so we're not saying where they are. Okay. Um, so I can tell you that there were two sanctuaries that were raided, one in Utah, one in Colorado. Um, I won't even say the names of the sanctuaries. The sanctuaries have both been traumatized by the experience, and, and so one of the reasons, I've said before, I think I did about 95% wrong in this case, um, which I think is true, like also the case. I'm not saying I didn't make a good effort, I did, but what I mean by 95% wrong is there were decision after decision after decision that I could have made better that would have had a significant impact on creating a more positive outcome for the end. And one of the many bad decisions I made, of those 95% I might tell the decisions that were just mistakes, was failure to properly prepare sanctuaries for the possibility of a criminal case. Um, the consequence of that is that I'm on good terms for everyone who's cared for living with. They're still my dear friends and they will be my dear friends for the rest of my life because we've gone through a lot with them. But it is important for anyone who's caring for animals from a situation where they could have been openly rescued, even if you don't know if they're openly rescued, to be properly prepared with, for example, knowing your rights. And actually, you were gonna ask this question. So among other things, knowing your rights means knowing that you have the right to remain silent. And one of the reasons the FBI did raid a second sanctuary is because some of the volunteers, not even the staff members, the volunteers at the first sanctuary did not know their rights and did not understand, not only did they have the right to remain silent, but every good criminal defense attorney in the nation, probably, not every, maybe there's some exception out there, but including me, and there are a lot of areas of criminal defense practice that I disagree with the criminal defense bar on, and I think defending activists is very different from defending normal, quote-unquote, criminals. 
But one piece of advice that I think is true of almost every criminal defense case and is sound is you should exercise your right to remain silent until you've talked to a lawyer. Right? And because volunteers at the first sanctuary in Utah did not exercise their right to remain silent, the prosecution found out where the piglets were or where they thought they were and raided a second sanctuary and traumatized a second set of volunteers and people. Um, so yeah, one of the many mistakes. It's another reason though why when I said this is not an anomaly, it's a precedent, because I think that if someone does 50% right or 95% right instead of 95% wrong, we have even stronger odds of winning trials like the Smithfield trial. Just don't do what I did with the sanctuaries in Utah and Colorado. Prepare them a little better for what might happen. Okay. Any other questions? Any other? Should I say anything about, else about knowing your rights? I'll say, okay. A few other things about knowing your rights as an activist. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to an attorney. Um, I honestly think probably the two other things I'll mention that are very important are what to do if there is an arrest or um, a search warrant or arrest warrant executed. And uh, probably the first mistake people make is they try and defend themselves and talk a lot, and there's no need to do that. By the time an officer is arresting you or executing a search warrant, they're already most likely not on your side. Now, in the long run, they're all on our side. You know, I believe in the beloved community. I believe all of us are good in this world. I believe that even people are acting badly are acting badly because they have a distorted vision of the world. They're not seeing the world that way it actually is. They're living in darkness. But in the meantime, you still are going to have adversaries who are going to try and stop social change, and the authorities are often your adversaries. So the first mistake people have make often is, is to speak too much. But the second mistake is not looking carefully at whatever arrest warrants, search warrants, or charging documents you have, and immediately recording them for your lawyers, but responding to them. So for example, if there's a search warrant that says a cop is entitled to search your bathroom, and the cop says, I'm going to go into your bedroom now and search your bedroom. If you say, okay, you have now consented for that cop to search an area beyond the search warrant because you said, okay. And you might think, because you didn't even look at the search warrant, well, I don't really have the power to do anything about this. There are cops with guns in my house and they're looking around. And I, I felt like I was just saying, like, okay, don't shoot me because you've got guns and I don't. You went and searched my bedroom. But you always at least need to verbally demonstrate your lack of consent. Because there have been many, many defendants and activists who have had their rights violated, but then have consented to it. So the authorities can then turn around and say, no, they consented to it. You know, you can see on the video footage, look at the body cam footage. Maybe the search warrant didn't allow me to look in the bedroom where I found the piglets. But the video footage shows that I said, I'm going to go and look in the bedroom. And, and, and the person said, yes, go ahead. So I consented to it. The other thing is, Anytime you have interactions with the police, I'm not saying do this in an aggressive way or hostile way. Be very respectful and polite and nonviolent. You should always document everything they do. Because if you don't document it, you don't have proof that any of your constitutional rights were violated. So if you ever interact with the police and you have a right to videotape the police, they say you don't, you know, obviously if a cop pulls a gun on you and says put that camera away, you should record that and then put the camera away because I don't want you to die. And cops have done this. And a lot of cops don't understand that we all have the, the freedom under the First Amendment of the United States to record what the cops are doing. But hopefully, after George Floyd and Eric Garner and all these horrible incidents, some of which happened here in your neck of the woods, right? Eric Garner was killed in Staten Island, right? Was it Staten Island? Or was it Long Island? Staten Island. Staten Island. Staten Island. Staten Island. So not too far from here, right? Staten Island. But it's surprising how many officers themselves don't understand the First in our Bill of Rights which is freedom of speech. And freedom of speech includes the freedom to document and publish what the cops are doing. So you should be documenting everything. I'm not saying like get in their face and say like, hey, you fucking cop, I hate your guts. You know, that's not what you should Actually, do, but James, peacefully. James Freeman does it. <laughs> if he does it, and I'm not gonna say anyone shouldn't do anything, but I will say you shouldn't do that. No, I mean, do what you gotta do, it's better to document it. So my advice is, exercise your right to make silent. Look carefully what the, the cops have ordered you and what documents, charging documents or legal documents are ordering you to do. And never consent to anything beyond that. Don't consent to a search. Don't consent to anything. Just say, I don't consent. And, try, and third, record that, including recording your lack of consent. Because they can lie. Cops lie all the time. It's shocking how often they lie. And even if you did consent to the search of your bedroom when the search warrant said the bathroom, if the cop puts in a statement that, no, 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 you know, like, what was your name again? Jeff. 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 Jeff said it was fine. You know, I, I wasn't planning to search the bedroom, but he invited me in there, and then that's where I found, you know, the piglet, and I took the piglet away. Because, but if you you're able to show that didn't happen, that's now an unconstitutional, unlawful search, 
and there's a doctrine of law called the fruit of the poison tree, that anything come that comes from a, an unconstitutional search or seizure on the Fifth Amendment is poison fruit and can no longer be used in a court of law. Right? So if you can show that original sin, that original act is wrongful and a violation of your rights, everything that flows from that, in theory at least, is gone too. In practice, because of things like judicial discretion, that's not what happens, but we still have to get, again, do your homework. Get all the details we can so we can make the best argument in a court of law on a later date. So those are just like three very simple pieces of advice. The other thing I'd say is because everyone's kind of terrified about the criminal justice system, and it's not unfair to be terrified, is uh, equip yourself with legal advice before you do actions. Because if you talk to lawyers in their organizations like the National Lawyers Guild, DXC has a legal team that's pretty strapped, so you can reach out to us. It's unlikely we'll respond unless you're doing something that's directly relevant to our work. But there's a National Lawyers Guild, the American Civil Liberties Union. There are lawyers out there who are there to help activists. And honestly, Google can be your friend too. But we found is when you're going to risky situations, if you have a little bit of knowledge about the law, it helps immensely. And, and actually, what I, one thing I didn't say is in addition to helping, and, and actually, do, do we have people's emails today who okay. came? If it's okay with me, I might send an email today and just follow up and see if anyone wants to help in those three areas in Tracy's case, right? Um, social media response and comms response court support, and campaigns. I'll email you all and ask if you want to help out, let me know. But the other thing I should tell you all about is tomorrow, I think some of you are actually coming, I'm doing an all day workshop that is a much more comprehensive analysis of Open Rescue and the Smithfield trial that will explain to you much further, step by step, how we won this trial, how we got to this point. So I really encourage all of you to come to that. And one of the things we do talk about in much more detail is knowing your rights and how you can start with your legal strategy even before you've been charged. Okay? Okay, I think we should probably wrap up, huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, on behalf of the World Vegan Vision, um, Avinash, I'd like to present you with a check. Oh my gosh, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, now I'll take it. Um, oh, you yeah. just asked for help. Yeah, there oh, you go. I appreciate uh, and actually, I forgot to say, there's a couple of people I'm going to acknowledge for organizations. One is Mr. Shaw, who's the founder of World Vegan Vision. He's 90 something years old, he's been vegetarian for, for decades, and been vegan for decades, and is, is really doing some tremendous work, including bringing this event today. So please, huge shout out to Mr. Shaw. Um, there are also just a ton of local organizations that are doing tremendous work, and I listed out some of them that I'm aware of, and I'm sure there are more. I just learned about this space today. But, um, you know, there's Nye Class, which is doing incredible legislative work for horses and has done that for years. There's um, uh, VFAR, Voters for Animal Rights, which has pushed a lot of legislative initiatives. Everyone should support Chili's on Wheels. You're Noel, right? Okay, so I, I heard about your organization does incredible work in Oakland. I actually thought it was the Bay Area fix, and I just learned the last days. It was actually founded in New York. Right? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Chili's on Wheels, which does work at the intersection of, of food justice and veganism. Vegan Activist Alliance, which is trying to bring us all together and work together, and that's so important that we always work together. No matter where you are on this movement, if you're doing direct action uh, on the one hand and someone else is doing legislative work or food service on the other, you still need to work together. And, and don't, don't fall victim to the narcissism of small differences. If you don't know that concept, I blog about it. Just look up the narcissism of small differences on my blog, The Simple Heart. Um, I'm trying to see, there's some other groups that I, that I know about. Um, I know there's a Black Veg Fest in the area, which is awesome. Coalition for Healthy School Food. Um, all these local organizations that are doing tremendous work. And so just support each other. Make sure you support local groups too. By all means, support Tracy and Buffalo and support us. But a lot of, you know, what, what we have done at DXC, that investigation at Smithfield started with a local group of people in a room exactly like this, just getting together and talking about what we wanted to do and what we thought we could do. And so if there are people in this room who listen to this talk and you're thinking to yourself, damn, you know, I, I, I think I can do that. First of all, I know you can. Like, I didn't believe I could do it, but you can. Everybody can. And again, that doesn't have, have to mean that you're the one who walks into the factory farm and takes that little baby and it out. If you want to do that, all the more power to you. And come to my workshop tomorrow, because I'll teach you how to do that in a way that is extremely powerful and effective and that can change the world of animal rights. But even if you're the person posting the social media about the recipe, doing the fundraising for the sanctuary after that animal needs medical care, needs the vet bills to be paid, everybody's got a role. But it starts with local activism and people in a room like this 
talking to each other. You know, Jeff and Mewtwo and Avinash and, and Ray and Michelle and Noel and all of you. And what was your name? Royce. Royce. All of you just like coming together and saying like, we didn't, there are factory farms in our neck of the woods. We've reported this sort of cruelty to the authorities in our state and they're not responding. And if we equip ourselves with these tools and understand the theory behind what DXC has done and what Wayne has done, we can replicate this with nine class or with voters for animal rights or whatever local, or Chili's on Wheels, whatever organization it is. Or even just invent one yourself. Call New York, New York for Animal Rights or New York for Open Rescue. You can do this. You can be one of those 100 cases. And if we get, we get those 100 cases on an annual basis, that, again, it's a prediction. It, it's, it, it's not, it's a, well, actually, no, it's not a prediction. I said it's not a prediction. It is a promise. If we have 100 cases like this, as impactful as this one case was, this industry will crumble in the weight of its own hypocrisy. But to do that, you have to recognize your power. And when I first walked into a slaughterhouse, even as a law professor, I was a very fancy law professor of all these fancy degrees. But back then, I thought, I can't walk into a slaughterhouse and take animals out. That's terrifying. And the only reason I did it was because I was a failed law professor. That's the part that's more interesting. That I was a law professor with all these fancy degrees, and I sucked at it, and I was about to lose my job. And that's why I walked into a slaughterhouse. But so I did it as an act of desperation. You should do it as an act of empowerment because you have the power to rescue animals from these abusive situations and take a little baby. Just think about this huddling, terrified baby who's about to be gassed to death, piled up three to a pile on top of each other, clamoring in the darkness, screaming in agony as CO2 is pumped into that chamber and they die slowly from being gassed to death. You can give that animal salvation. Like every single one in this room can do that. But to do that, you have to see your own power, okay? and see the collective power you have when you work together, because no one's going to do it alone. And the one, well not the one, but one of the biggest mistakes I made when I did first walk into a slaughterhouse in the year 2007 was I did it alone. And it turns out it's really hard to rescue animals alone. You can't do it, or you can, but it's going to be very, very, I was about to say another f -bomb. so I'm not going to say it. I respect you and I respect everyone who doesn't want me using f -bomb. It's very, very hard but you, it, to do it alone, but if you have a team and you're working together in a community, it's so much easier, and that's what we need. Okay. Wait, I, I also want to say something else. So you said tomorrow we can come and yeah. get a lot of education, but there's another, there's a conference coming up. Okay. Right? There is an animal liberation conference. That's right. <laughs> uh, yeah. There's an animal, and it's in May, so you just go to animal liberation conference, come to that. You've come to it, right, right? I haven't yet. Okay, no. you got to come to it. Where is that one? So that's in Bay Area. It's going to be in, I think it's I in Oakland or maybe Berkeley. Uh, I should know more details. I'm actually not that operationally in tune with, I, I, I'm still very involved in DXC stuff, but I'm not operationally that involved because I stepped back from leadership in 2019 to do stuff like be a defendant. But it, it is a transformative conference. It's been one of our best tools for training and mobilizing people. We've done historic actions together. So please come to the Animal Liberation Conference as well. Um, there's likely to be almost like a mini summit in Buffalo around April. Oh, Tracy's nice. court date is April 13th. We're gonna do other organizing around it. I might do another workshop then, but there's going to be food and fun and activists coming together. You know, people from Toronto are going to come down. Hopefully, people from New York go up to Niagara County to support Tracy. You know, show the district attorney that the people of this state and this nation do not support animal slaughter. We support animal care and animal rescue. So there are lots of opportunities to get out there and support this movement and support the animals. But it all starts with you feeling like you have the power. Which you do. You do. Okay. All right. Cool. Great. Thank you, Wayne. Simple Heart Initiative, no yeah. Simple Heart. So, so tomorrow, yeah, my, my blog, which I encourage all of you to follow, and I might even just add you to my blog if, uh, if Avinash and Mentor give me your emails, it's called The Simple Heart. It's on Substack, The Simple Heart. And the workshop tomorrow is in Manhattan. I think it's possible to still register for it. You absolutely do have to register and apply. Um, and just email, message me on Facebook and one of my team members. I actually don't use my own Facebook, but one of my team members will apply to you and give you the details. But if you message me on Facebook or post on Facebook somewhere, um, you can also just email me at wayne at the simple heart.org, wayne at the simple heart.org, or wayne.